Hello, I'm Devin Brody. I'm Stephen Daniels. I'm Michael Guzman. I'm Joe Geiler. And this is our presentation in analysis of waste management through systems thinking. Hi, my name is Stephen Daniels, and I will be starting off our group presentation about waste management in a social ecological system. Waste management has been a human practice for a very long time now. It likely started with midden pits our prehistoric ancestors used. If waste piled up, the natural system, which was one purely of biological decomposition, was in balance with the ecosystem. With a little time, nutrients, chemicals, organic and inorganic materials would flow into their various nutrient system spheres and be absorbed by the ecosystem. But with large populations, like with cities, all kinds of waste starts to build up, creating the possibility of tipping the system out of balance. Waste management in the modern world has grown into a problem that landfills cannot solve anymore. Fertilizers and pesticides run off farmlands into rivers, factories pollute air and water, landfills are leaching into the groundwater, the endless plastic we use is now pulling on top of our oceans like an oil slick, microfiber is in the air everywhere, Trace amounts of pharmaceuticals can now be found in most of our water sources. Ecosystems worldwide are struggling to keep resilient. Traditionally, a landfill can be covered up and the land can soon be used again. A farmer grows what is best suited for the land. Groundwater remains clean and ecosystems can absorb disturbances with relative ease. However, after the industrial revolution of the 1800s, an explosion of technological discovery ushered in a new age of manufacturing and synthetic materials. Many of these new materials were chemicals and substances that could last for thousands of years. Essentially, a new variable was introduced to the system. When humans started creating things, we make stock. From fertilizers to plastic, the use of and using up of these products could then flow to landfills, rivers, aquifers, and the atmosphere. The relatively new practice of using a mass consumption linear economy based on sales and GDP not only extended the time it takes to reclaim land from landfills, it has made them toxic, seeping into groundwater, and it has plugged the tub of our system. Waste is literally spilling over into other ecological and socio-ecological systems. This has created a positive feedback loop where ecological systems are being pushed into a new regime. What's worse, we have created these new types of waste problems that can't be addressed with traditional landfill management practices. Landfills, agriculture, and mass production have pushed the natural system to its limits. Landfills and recycling centers are not able to accommodate chemicals and or atmospheric pollution that our society is now mass producing. We do not even have the ability to pick up the chemicals like fertilizers, pesticides, and atmospheric pollutants to bury them in landfills even if we could. The addition of these products to our social ecological waste management system has strained its resiliency and pushed it to the limits of functioning normally. Hey guys, I'm Michael, and I'm going to be doing an assessment of the socio-ecological system. So right off the bat, the key stakeholders in this SES would consist of the farmer relying on the quality of soil to generate slash regenerate his produce, to the community whom is affected by the agricultural runoff from the yield, to the variety of species within the Everglades that are affected from the excess runoff from the yield as well. So as you can see here, there's a diagram that shows the process of the nitrogen cycle, which illustrates how denitrifying bacteria convert the nitrate back into nitrogen gas, which re-enters the atmosphere. Nitrogen from runoff and fertilizers enter the ocean, where it enters marine food webs. A detrimental mental model that affects the socio-ecological system is the belief in human nature that what goes in the trash is gone forever. This mismanagement of waste is evident in this scenario where a farmer has bounded rationality on his farm producing an excess amount of nitrogen runoff as a result of heavy fertilizer and pesticide use. These byproducts and negative externalities are evident of how, I'm sorry, are evidence of how this mental model impacts this SES as seen in the photo. The biggest disturbances within this system would have to be wasteful consumption habits via traditional farming practices that require heavy chemical use such as pesticide and fertilizer use. 
Another example would be planned and perceived obsolescence, which is a marketing technique that deems fairly new products outdated, such as iPhones, outdated by virtue of a newer version or model coming out in the, within the market. So as you can see in this photo, it pretty much sums it up in a nutshell and represents how wasteful consumption is the biggest disturbance of the SES. Lastly, a threshold that can potentially be crossed within this system that represents an entirely new regime is overfilling the capacity of a landfill. This leads to the toxicity of a land, which unfortunately leads to the tipping point of groundwater being contaminated. Once that occurs, the water supply of a community may be contaminated, which involves the health of the social components of the system being threatened. So as you can see in this photo, the, what would lead to that new regime would be an abundance of waste causing the landfill to reach its full capacity. Resiliency in the SES. Promoting overall resilience. Factors that promote overall resilience in the system are changes in societal attitudes over waste, determining what proper management will be, and our feelings of responsibility. Societal attitudes range from political policies to our everyday actions. Determining what proper management will be, will be determining how we wish to dispose of waste, how we wish to recycle waste, and if we even feel like generating it in the first place. Feelings of responsibility dictate whether or not <laughs> We even feel like we need to take care of the issue. Leverage points and intervention. Those in power can intervene within the system in the form of buffers, information sharing, and the creation and enforcement of rules. Interventions such as long-term intervention, self-organization, and paradigm shifts might be needed to build resilience into this SES. As with all socio-ecological systems, intervention within the waste management system is crucial. Adaptive capacity. Adaptive capacity in the system would be how much and how well those who recycle, reclaim, or dispose of materials can change direction when need be. For example, in January 2018, China implemented the National Solar Policy, a policy that dictated they would no longer take recyclables from the United States and other developed Western nations. This left many recycling facilities in a scramble to find who would take our waste. This caused a very massive disturbance, and this uncovered just how weak the system can really be. The future of waste management, a focus on data, planning, and integration. Is transformation necessary in the waste management socio-ecological system? This graph shows the global plastics production of the entire world since 1950. Even 70 years ago, our net produce, production of plastics was very small, reasonable, and manage, manageable. As you can see, over the last 70 years, this graph has grown exponentially. With anything in nature that is growing exponentially, it is never sustainable. So with the amount of waste that we're producing, it's going to have to change somehow or another for the good or for the worse. We make over 380 million tons of plastic each year, and that's not including the plastic that is reused and recycled. Studies show that typically the chemicals within petroleum-based plastics can leach into their surrounding environments, as well as take thousands of years to properly degrade. One thing that we could do is move towards biodegradable products that don't use petroleum as a base, but they use natural resins instead. These plastic type materials could replace many of the things that we use today, especially one use food based plastic items that are one of the most unused plastics that cannot be recycled. A big part of this is having people putting effort into the mitigation, reusability, and conservation. Matikatsu, a step in the right direction. In smaller countries, waste management can comprise almost 20% of municipal budgets. That's a lot of money being spent towards just waste. In Japan, there's a small town called Kamatsukatsu. It's very rural and it does have a, a smaller population. But one thing that community has done on their own 
is they recycle everything. In the town, there's over 45 different categories of what they can consider recyclable. And overall, the town recycles 80% of the little trash that it makes. They found that it costs six times less to run their recycling system compared to the normal means of getting rid of waste by incinerating everything. Everybody volunteers and they bring their own trash into the waste collection center. Volunteers help sort through all the processes and only about 20% ends up in an actual dumpster, stuff that can't possibly be recycled. So what they do is they carefully divide, organize, and distribute the waste to the, the proper areas. And any food waste, if there's any food waste, is constantly reused, turned into compost and fertilizer and used to grow more food. These offer some ways to help other communities. We can reduce food waste through consumer education, organics management, and coordinated food waste management programs. We can help provide financial aid to countries that are the fastest growing and developing demographics to be able to develop state-of-the-art waste management systems instead of relying on an outdated system. We can also support major waste producing countries and lobby to help reduce their consumption of plastics and marine litter through comprehensive waste reduction and recycling programs. The biggest thing that I, I wanna leave with is that it doesn't start with everybody, it starts with one person, which can then be built into a habit and a community outreach. Thank you, that was our presentation. I'll leave you with a quote. We abuse land because we regard it as a commodity belonging to us. When we see land as a community to which we all belong, we may begin to use it with love and respect. Aldo Leopold. This is our reference page. All references are cited within the text.